Yeah, sounds good. Welcome, everybody. I don't know how many people have already in. Uh, very few, but you're starting to come in. And so for the next five minutes or so, 10 minutes, there'll be people coming in, 15 minutes, actually. But in the meantime, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started in a minute or two when the bulk of you have gotten in. Um, uh, hopefully everybody's having a beautiful day. The sun's out here in LA and it's gorgeous. It's been raining for days. And if there was a mountain open somewhere, I would be snowboarding and skiing and everything else right after these webinars. But unfortunately, Baldi is still open, isn't it? Baldi? I, I thought everybody had to shut down by law. So if Baldi's open, that would be amazing. I saw but, some blurb about it the other day. Yeah, that I'll, I'll, I'll double check at some point. Check on Baldi. That would be an interesting... Uh, uh, a short drive. If anything, you could hike probably. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Bali would be awesome. I haven't been there in years. I love that place. I think Eric, Eric's been up um, skinning in uh, Tahoe. Oh, oh, yeah. That would be, well, there's endless skinning in Tahoe probably for months on end at this point. Yeah. yeah. Mammoth too, because they got hammered and, well, nobody's riding. Mm -hmm. Unless you're skinning. I have those, I have those uh, cheap skins that could go. <laughs> Head up there. Um, although I broke them. Um, okay. So let's, uh, let's see, we're at 52. That's probably the, 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 that's always for about the next 15 minutes, we'll get up to about 70 or so, like or somewhere around there. So um, with that said, I want to welcome Dave Stoltz to the call. Uh, for those of you that don't know Dave, Dave is my business partner. For those of you that do from the workshops, you'll know that he is an extreme sports athlete. He loves risk. He manages risk well. He's been doing it his whole life from uh, everything from what, skateboarding, 24-hour mountain bike racing, right? Uh, ice climbing, yep. uh, skydiving, wingsuiting, motocross. Uh, I don't know if I've covered it all there, but... <laughs> uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, he, he does a little bit of everything and he loves to do it. He's, he, uh, since I've known him, I've watched him uh, go through different things and he just, he gets deep into it and he, and he, he gets to know it really well. And so he's going to be talking on this call about managing risk, taking really intelligent risks to grow yourself, to expand your reality, to become good with tension because everything he does, you have to be good with tension. Otherwise you kill yourself. So, um, so I want to welcome Dave to the call and know that, Dave's uh, at most of the advanced workshops too. Um, and he's a, he's more of a natural. A lot of the guys that we talked to have had to develop their tension skills. He grew up with tension skills. It was part of his, uh, his life. I remember he's got a good story. I don't know if he's going to tell it about when he snuck out of his house at what, what old <laughs> like three or something and ran away. And Eight, 18 oh, months, 18 months. He went for a walk to go find dad and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll let him tell all these stories, but uh, they're great stories. And uh, so I want to welcome uh, again, Dave to the call and everybody get ready to take some notes because he's got great uh, adventures, tension stories, all kinds of stuff coming. So, so uh, welcome Dave. Thanks man. Good yeah, to be no here. I might, I might, I might ask a question here and there and, and jump in, but for the most part, I'll let you run unless you want me to ask you a lot of questions about stuff or dig in, you tell me, but. I mean, it, you know, you and the team know me well. If something pops into your mind where you feel that it would be important to share, um, let's talk about it, you know, because you guys, you know, you guys remember my stories. To me, they're all just a blur because there's so many and, you know, I don't know what's relevant and what's not. And there's certain things that are relevant to me and aren't to other people. So if you guys think of anything or... Um, remember anything that you want to talk about and bring up, then let's do it. I, I will definitely do that because I know lots of them. So um, I will bring them up as, as we go. <laughs> so let's hop on in. So, yeah, um, I kind of just wanted to talk about this uh, current situation that we're in. And <clears throat> some of my very first thoughts around what was happening when, uh, when this thing started. So, you know, CV-19 has been around since December or whatever. Uh, I've been in Japan with uh, all of that stuff going on in Japan with tens of thousands of Chinese tourists. Um, made it out alive, came back to the U.S., went to Europe, chased me there. <laughs> Had to turn around and come back here to the States, and now it's here. So, you know, I've been uh, fighting off uh, CV-19 for three months, four months now. Hasn't gotten me yet, so that's a good thing. Um, 
but it's a pretty unique landscape that we're in right now. And a lot of people um, are not familiar with the landscape we're in right now because it's a bizarre thing that's happening. It's such a, a very strange thing. And one thing that I used to help navigate this was my gut, my guttural instincts around, um, you know, the weirdness of what this pandemic is. Like nobody knows what's going on. Nobody knows um, what to do. And to me, it was more frustrating than not knowing what to do. And through my uh, many years of experience of always stepping into the unknown, always not knowing what's going to happen next. Um, I was able to really tune into my gut and say, what are the, what are the action steps here to move everything forward regarding business, regarding my own personal mental health, physical health, and, um, you know, not getting wrapped up in the drama and the chaos of what, what is happening in this pandemic now. And I really attribute that to my entire lifestyle and out there pushing the limits, always stepping into the unknown. It's really allowed me to make solid decisions in this time of quote unquote crisis. Um, I personally don't feel it's a crisis. It's just, you know, a little hiccup that we're dealing with and we'll get over it. But um, yeah, so when the borders were shut down in the US, um, I was on a plane to Turkey. I landed in Istanbul and got bombarded with messages about the country closing in one day. And I never made it to my final destination, which was a group of fearless guys going to snowboard in Georgia in the uh, Caucasus Mountains, right on the edge of Russia. So um, any of the guys that are in the group and have worked with us, you know that you get invited to these types of trips. So we all had to turn around and come home, unfortunately. And when I got off the plane, there was a lot of freak out within our group and people just turned tail and, and ran, which is a smart thing to do. But I kind of took my time and I was like, okay, what are the risks here? What is, how do I manage this situation? Because when I got off the plane, it became very real to me that this was a serious event and, you know, we need to handle it appropriately. So um, I kind of had some feelings from 9-11 come up again. And I thought that was really interesting. So I was like, wow, this is, this is a world issue now. Like, this is a real deal thing. I was like, this is unknown, kind of like when 9-11 happened, it was unknown. And I, and I started recalling all this information, like how I felt in 9-11, you know, what it, what it made me do and like how I kind of freaked out back then because it was a, that was a huge scarring moment in, you know, every American's life and around the world as well. So um, I kind of looked at that and I was like, well, this isn't that. And I, I let myself kind of think, okay, I'm going to get through this. This isn't as bad as 9-11. This is just a little bit of an unknown thing. And uh, we're just going to have to take it day by day because this landscape is so unfamiliar to us. I really felt like uh, an explorer in an unknown land at that point as, as I was getting off the plane. And these are all the thoughts running through my head as I'm getting off the plane and walking through the airport. You know, I felt like Shackleton or, or Sir Edmund Hillary or, um, you know, Jacques Cousteau exploring the world and not having all the technology that we have and all the resources and they were just true explorers and it's kind of the way I felt um, as I was thinking about all this new information that just got hammered into everybody's consciousness um, within a matter of like 24 hours as they shut down the, the borders of the country so and um, so yeah I was just like wow you know these guys were out exploring like they were just doing their thing and and they just took it one day at a time, one minute at a time. And I was like, that's what I need to do to do this. And so that's what I started doing. And then as I, and that lasted about 15 minutes about how to navigate this thing. And then I, I was like, okay, well, hold on a second. There's opportunity here. And so that's when my business brain started kicking in. I was like, okay, all the markets are going to crash. Um, there's going to be opportunity in business here. How do I, uh, flip this and make it a positive. So about 15 minutes of, Kind of like a downhill decline dealing with everything and worries and this and that and then with after with after 15 minutes or so of that kind of worry and it going away i was right back into the mode is like how do i turn this into a positive how do i make this thing uh work out to uh, my advantage and um, that's what i did and 
I went and started watching the markets. I started calling people that, uh, that advised me in business and having conversation and really turned it into an opportunity um, and have already profited from, from that day, which is, which is great. So, you know, that's kind of how I handled um, the onslaught of this uh, pandemic. At first it was a little fear and then of some worry and then frustration. And then I was like, hold on a second. I've been through this a thousand times in my life. This is just another unknown landscape that, that I have to figure out. And so that's exactly what I did. And um, everything's been going great. Um, very, very happy with uh, the way things have been working out. So um, that the past has really helped me dictate and drive how I'm handling the future in the unknown. So I really boiled it down to, well, it's just an un another unknown experience to me and I'm gonna get through it no problem. So that's what I've been doing. And so how did I develop this skill set, right? It, you know, Brian alluded to the, at the beginning of the call, um, you know, adventure intentions always kind of been something that I have been drawn to, which is very true. At 18 months, I climbed over my parents' fence at their house and made my way through two intersections with traffic lights. And for some reason at 18 months old, I was able to figure out how traffic lights worked, made my way through the traffic lights, and was on my way like over a mile away from my parents' house at that time, going to see my dad at work. Um, my dad worked in the mining industry. And at that, that age, I knew how to navigate through the city. I knew how to get to where he worked. I knew where he worked. Um, so uh, I made it about a half a mile away from my parents' house and uh, my mom caught me. And that was just kind of the beginning of me going out and going wild and um, really pushing the, uh, the envelope there. And it, it's just never stopped. I've always been drawn to self-challenge. I've always been drawn to the unknown. And um, those types of experiences have just continued through my life, whether it's been rock climbing, whether it's been snowboarding, um, motocross, skydiving, and kind of getting into skydiving. We'll get into that a little bit. Um, here in a little bit, but um, as far as my life coming up through like elementary school, middle school, high school, I'd always been skateboarding. I'd always been challenging myself. Um, learning tricks is the unknown, right? It's, it's uh, you, you have to practice and, and develop the skill set. You just don't know it and you, and you learn it just like riding a bike. It's something foreign and, and new. And so you take the time to learn it. And that's kind of what I did with when, when COVID hit and, you know, worked with my mindset about how to handle this thing. So, um, you know, in high school, I did, did a lot of sports and stuff. I never did any team sports or anything like that. Anything like that. Um, I was always looking for opportunities to go and challenge myself. Um, rock climbing was very big uh, in high school. Um, so I'd always had my purpose. I'd always been working. I'd always been uh, able to get myself into some a little a little business deal here, a little business deal there. And that allowed me to develop and, and explore my entrepreneurial uh, spirit. And this, again, entrepreneurship, business ownership is, it's all an unknown every day, pretty much. As much as we feel like we know what we're doing in business, nobody knows what they're doing. Uh, they're just doing the best they can along the way. And some people have really got it figured out. And a lot of people don't, and that's fine, but you still need to be willing to step every day into the unknown to a new day of business and, and learn from it. And um, that's, uh, that's how we've grown Fearless. That's how I've grown other little businesses that I've been involved in. And it's just something that I've always been willing to explore, put myself out there, take the risk. And, um, and it's been a, a very positive experience. And when you go out and you let yourself have experience and you let yourself explore, then you build confidence because you know then. And if you don't let yourself explore, if you don't let yourself go out and have any kind of experience whatsoever, or you mute that experience or you hold back on that experience, then you will um, absolutely not have any confidence, which is pretty much the case for a lot of people that come to work with Fearless is, they, they live a very muted, very um, held back lifestyle. They don't just go out and, and put it on the chopping block and say, 
here I am and um, you know, let's see what we can do. So if you're willing to do that, um, and as, as the guys work through their workshops at Fearless, they, they're able to start doing that. And that really helps them step into the tension, take a lot more risks, and really go out and live an amazing lifestyle. The ones that really put the work in. Um, and this, this is work. And what I find fascinating is, you know, I'm, I'm 43 and it's taken me 43 years to figure out how to manage all this stuff. And with the workshops at Fearless, if I had something like that at 18, oh my God, the mess I'd be in now would be incredible. So um, the guys that are coming in are, are really getting a head start on being able to manage risk, tension, and go after you know their dream life that they like to live. Um, this really, the, the, the highest level that I've achieved personally didn't come until after I faced a fear that I actually created for myself. And this is what almost everybody does. This is exactly what we do. We take something that is not real, i.e. a fear of some kind, and we build stories and manifestations around it. And then what happens, it becomes real in our reality outside of ourselves. Um, I did this with flying. I did a couple flights, took my first uh, flight out to Jackson Hole to go skiing with a, a group of people. And um, it was an okay experience. It was my first time ever flying. It was really interesting. Um, did a couple more flights out to California, to Northern California, do some skiing, see some friends in San Francisco. And on those flights, I had, I had created this crazy fear of flying. I have no idea why it got that bad. Um, you know, they were some rough and turbulent flights, some of them, but um, I've been on worse today. So I don't really understand how I developed this fear, but long story short is I did. I developed this fear that the plane was going to crash, that I shouldn't be flying, all of this bullshit. And it was all on me. I created it. It was never there before I flew. It was only after I started flying. And so I had just kept manifesting this fear to the point where I actually had a panic attack on a plane one time. And uh, it was like in the fetal position, like freaking out on the plane. And that was the last day I ever flew. And then I didn't get on an air get on an airplane or do any flying for 10 years. And so I go from being this adventurous person, you know, in my teens and early twenties to not flying for 10 years, um, driving everywhere. I've driven across the country seven times, coast to coast, which is beautiful. I highly recommend doing it if you haven't done it. Um, again, there's something that was very unknown. I did that the first time when I was uh, 18. You know, I didn't know what it was like to drive across the country. Um, I just had a paper map and a shitty car and some cash to buy gas because I had sold a, a mountain bike. I was like, well, I estimate about this much cash for gas <laughs> and just went and did it. So um, again, that was a, another unknown experience. And now I, I know the landscape of this country. I know the Southern route, the mid route and the Northern routes across the country. Um, so it's uh Again, another example of the unknown and just going out there and doing it. But back to the flying thing, um, I had missed out on many opportunities to go to Europe, uh, people offering me um, jobs. I, I turned down one job making $80,000 a year shooting travel photography, all expenses paid around the world. Um, and that was anywhere in the world that the magazine wanted me to go. And it was starting 80 grand a year, turned it down because I didn't want to fly. Very dumb. Um, so as that kind of ate away at me in my mid twenties and more and more opportunities to travel were coming up in my, uh, my later twenties, I uh, still wouldn't get on a plane. And I was like, this is ridiculous. I'm missing out on tons of opportunity. And I just kind of had this little epiphany one day. I was like, I have no logical reason as to why I'm afraid of flying. And I then figured out, well, if I created this fear, I can uncreate it. And so that's exactly what I did. I went to work um, for many years uncreating what I created. And it was a difficult task because I didn't know what the root of the true fear was. And I'll, and I'll get to that toward the end here. So 
I got an online uh, self-help class for flying for like 20 bucks and watched that like 50 times. It didn't really help that much, helped a little bit. And um, then started learning about the mechanics of planes, flying, aviation. Um, and this was over the course of probably about three years. And I finally got to myself into a place where I was like, I'm going to take a flight. So I, uh, the first flight I did, I was like, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to go, go for it. And so I flew back out to the West coast, amazing flight, beautiful day, um, hung out in uh, Los Angeles and then, and flew back. And I was like, wow, I, you know, I did it. I conquered it, conquered this fear. But there's, it's still, there was still anxiety. There was still fear at a deeper root level. And then I was like, okay, this is, uh, this is still not exactly the way I want it to be. At the time, I was running a clothing, clothing company, and I was at a base jumping event. And some friends had said, hey, you, know, you, should, uh, you should come skydiving. I was like, no way. <laughs> and uh, long story short, they... Uh, they talked me into it. They were super cool people. Talked me into it. I uh, went to the drop zone, freaked out, made a little video of myself freaking out because I was curious about the, the contrast of before I jumped and after. So I made a video ahead of time. And I think I have that video somewhere, but I'm like talking to the camera, freaking out. I thought it was really funny. Uh, and when I watch it now. And so I did it. Yeah, I was like, I'm committing to this. I'm going to do At it. At some point, we have to post that video. You have to yeah, I'll have to see if I can find it. first I've ever heard of this video. So. Yeah, I'll have to see if I can find it. It'll be, uh, it'll be funny if I, uh, if I can find it. But I have seen it. I think I saw it like last year, but I'll double check. <laughs> that would be gold. So. Um, so I get in the plane. You know, I'm feeling confident with my friends because this is what they do professionally. And... Who climb up to 14,000 feet and the door opens. And I was just like, what the hell am I doing? Like, this is nuts. And then it's our turn to jump. And I just was like, I'm, I'm going whether I want to or not. And as we left the plane and I'm watching, watching us go out the door and the plane just going away, in that split second of leaving the door of the plane, I realized what my fear was. And the truest fear was I had a fear of falling out of planes and hitting the ground. And this comes from a very primal fear that everybody's born with fear of loud noises and then fear of falling. Those are the two primal fears that we're born with. And so this was my fear of falling. The, one of the most primal fears you can have. Um, I realized, wow, that was it and had an amazing time on the sky, rest of the skydive. And I had all these realizations in about two seconds. So it's pretty amazing when you put yourself in the tension, when you put yourself um, on the chopping block, how quickly you come to terms with your own bullshit. And so that's exactly what I did. And the second we got to the ground, I was like, I want to do that again. And so we did. Um, I did uh, a couple tandem jumps to get used to the whole experience. Then I went and got my A license, then I got my B license, and then I got my C license. So um, right now I'm a C license skydiver. I don't have a lot of jumps. I have 270 jumps. Um, I've got seven wingsuit flights. All that is not a lot. For people that don't jump, they think it's a lot, but it's not. In the world of skydiving, it's, you're still a baby. So I've done a lot, but not really. And that whole experience changed my life forever. Um, I did my first jump back in 2012 or 11. I can't remember which. And since that point of facing that fear, that root fear, my life has exploded in such an insane rate that I can't even imagine um, some of the things I've been able to do. And I'm going to kind of share my screen here, show you guys some pictures real quick of some of the skydiving stuff and some of the things I've got to do and I'll, and I'll talk about them as we, as we go through here. So give me a second. So um, this guy, this guy sitting in the plane, that's actually a fearless student. I took some of these guys out to jump. Can you guys see that photo? Yes. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, cool. So this is in California. Um, went out to, uh, take one of the fearless guys out to jump. And uh, 
This is me on a Monday morning flying over uh, Lake Elsinore. Um, I've skydived into Burning Man. I know a lot of people love just to go to Burning Man. Um, I've been seven times and going to Burning Man is just not enough anymore. Um, so I decided to skydive in one year. So that was in 2017. And uh, you can see the whole city underneath of me. So uh, this is a really, really cool jump. Um, again, because I faced my fears, this is in Australia over Airlie Beach. Um, I've been paid to go to Australia three times now um, to skydive and to be a part of a, a travel company. Um, so this is me jumping over Airlie Beach. And as you can see, there's lots of ocean around and there's lots of mountains around. This is a really technical jump. Um, a lot of dangers, obviously water hazards. And um, we have some high winds as well, closer to the ground that come in. Um, and then we also in the mountains have this weird shrub that if you hit it, it releases these little spores into the air and if you breathe them in, can damage your lungs and liquefy your lungs and you basically suffocate kind of like COVID. So I learned all this as we were doing this jump and I was like, wow, this is an interesting jump here. <laughs> uh, definitely challenging, but pulled it off, no problem. Got all the video that the company wanted me to get. Uh, and, and again, this is, these opportunities that come to me because I faced my, my, my primal fear, right? That fear of falling. And then to continue on here, this is me later that year in the kingdom of Jordan, skydiving with the Prince of Jordan. We did three jumps together, had a great time. And uh, again, another opportunity that came to me for facing my fear. And let's see here. Uh, this is me under canopy flying in to land at Burning Man. And then my life continues on with travel. This is uh, Chile. We're riding down a volcano here. Uh, Brian was on this trip. So I travel all over the world now because I face this fear and I live an amazing lifestyle. Um, this is Japan this year. And then I got into aviation pretty hardcore. Um, I'm a partner in a helicopter company and have been dabbling in flying helicopters. It's been an amazing experience, lots of fun. And this is one of the helicopters the company owns. And then I get to do other things like go to Greece with my girlfriend Anna here and go to Italy and go to all these amazing places that people just dream about. I get to go live and do it. And here we are in Iceland. And this last photo here is if you guys have watched Kill Bill, you might recognize this restaurant. This is uh, Gampachi in Japan. And our friends in Japan set this up and uh, Matt and Brian and Josh were in Japan. Um, I was flying back from Thailand. They, these guys set this up. They had a birthday party for me at Gopachi. The entire restaurant sang happy birthday to me and made a huge spectacle out of this. It was an incredible experience, and I think this is my 40th birthday, and it was uh, definitely one I'll never forget. So these are just a couple little tidbits of, you know, what my life has been like. Um, ever since I handled that fear, and being able to handle your fears and mitigate your risks affords you the ability to go live an amazing lifestyle. And a lot of the times have other people pay for it. I mean, most people dream of going to Australia. I've been there three times and I've never paid to go. This is an amazing experience to have and countless other experiences I've had that people give me things for free and um, you know, give me discounts on this and that. I don't ask for this stuff, it's just given. So it's very, very important to find out your primal fears and then really work on handling them and moving forward to, um, to get to the life that you want to live. And this is what I've done. And it's taken, um, taken a lot of time, a lot of effort and facing a lot of fear. Uh, and it helps me every day in everything that I do, whether it's business, whether it's sports, 
whether it's making an investment, um, it's, it's been phenomenal. And I really, really enjoy my lifestyle now. Not that I didn't before. I always enjoyed my lifestyle. I've always been out having fun, whether I had money or not. And a lot of people look at this and they're like, oh, well, you know, you just spend a lot of money. No, I don't. And when I was much younger and didn't have a solid job or anything, I was still traveling at the, at the rate I'm traveling now. Um, I'm probably traveling more now. <clears throat> but I always had done it by trading off something because let's face it, travel can be expensive sometimes. So I would have something that I perceived as a lesser value. So I would sell it so that I could get something that was a, of a higher value, which was the travel. And I'd always played this game of rotating things over and over. Um, and I tried not to become really attached to anything. So there were certain things that I wouldn't sell, but um, there, there are a lot of opportunities out there that uh, you can afford if you release your attachments to some things that you really don't need and just get rid of the stuff and go and, and travel and have a great life. Um, I've even had uh, one of the more prominent art museums in, um, in Baltimore here pay for a trip for me across the country because they needed someone to deliver a piece of sculpture. So I worked out a deal. Uh, to deliver a piece of sculpture and they paid for the whole trip. So there's countless ways to afford your travel addiction, if you will, or even go and travel a little bit. You don't have to do it on the scale that I do. And there's people that blow me out of the water when it comes to travel. Um, so there, there's a way to do it. You just keep working at it and working at it and working at it and working at it. And my friends that have known me for a long time, they know that this has been you know, my dream and I've worked really hard to achieve it. Nothing has been handed to me at all. And it has been an uphill fight because of this, this is, this is what happens when you're going after something you need to prove that you want it. And if you don't prove that you want it and fight for it every day, it's going to not come to you the way uh, that you, you think it's going to, it just doesn't work like that. You have to put in the time, you have to put in the effort, and you have to uh, do the work, much like uh, all the guys that come into Fearless here and, and do all the work uh, on themselves. And this, this all starts at an internal place, clearly by my example of this fear that I created with skydiving. It was an internal fear, and it was affecting my entire external world uh, to the point of detriment, to the point of loss. And I had to get that internal piece hammered out and figured out and done with before my life could explode to the next level. And now I'm, I'm looking at myself even deeper to find even the next level because this level is, is great, but it's still not good enough. And uh, I'm always raising the bar for myself and I'm always want the next, the next uh, level of something because it's just, I enjoy the challenge. Again, that's something that's been in me since I was 18 months old climbing over that fence. That's where it all started. And it hasn't stopped and it won't stop until the day I die. It's just who I am. Um, so I, you know, I really recommend you guys working on finding the deepest uh, possible fears inside of you, looking at what you perceive as risks, uh, which really aren't. Um, they're just more fears brought up by more thoughts that you've created and managing all that. And that, that is ultimately how you manage the perceived risk is managing your internal self and everything around that. And most risk is fear-based, most of it. So um, what, um, what kind of questions do we have? I feel like answering some questions. I wanna, right um, I wanna, you said a lot of really interesting stuff there. And the last question that came in from Sunan is really interesting because it relates to what I was thinking about. And I want to I want to double on his question. How did how did you get these opportunities to get paid travel? I realize you faced your fear, but what what do we do practically to do these cool things? And I find that uh, by law of polarity, law of opposites, uh, everybody always has the opportunity right in front of them uh, to do what they really want to do. If it's travel, it's always sitting there. The hardest part is getting started because when you first get started, there's all that your stories about why I can't quit my job, I can't take the time off, I don't have the money. And I don't hear any of that in you. In you, I hear, why not quit your job? Uh, go be broke. Go sleep on a couch. Go be live in a van. I know you did that for a while. I've, I've um, done all of it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so in you, I hear. I don't hear these excuses. I hear, well, what's the big deal? If I get broke for a while, I'll just make more money later. In your attitude, I hear that in your sure. attitude. Sure. So, can you talk to Sunit on that one? Sure. I mean that. <clears throat> 
this, this is real life, right? Um, I, I don't accept excuses and I don't accept excuses, excuses from students. And I surely don't accept excuses from myself. And we are all hammered with excuses every day because they're, we, we, we love to use them to, uh, to live this fallacy out. And it, it's, it's not important to, to listen to those excuses. What's important is to go against the grain, go and do where, what your gut and your heart is, is leading you to do. It's really important to quit your job if you're dying inside and you wanna go travel, to go broke if you need to. Um, Speaking of going broke, this is kind of a funny story real quick. I, when I was in California one time, I had run out of money to get home. And I went to this like, I don't know what it was, some kind of festival. And I ended up getting on the radio and pleading my case to people at this festival. And people ended up giving me $1,000 in gas money to get back home. I told them I had driven out there and I got stranded, didn't have a job and was looking for gas money to get back home. And, and this radio host had overheard me talking to some people and he put me on the air and people at the festival came up to the stage where they were broadcasting from. And I, I collected a thousand dollars in about four hours and was able to get back home. <laughs> and some profit. Yeah. And, like. and some profit. Well, I don't know about that thousand bucks across the country for fuel. That's, that's about right. Um, but, but you're correct, Brian. Like I, I never let the excuses get in the way. I was like, this is what I want to do. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but this is what I want to do. And I go and do it. And what's really important is when you start taking a stand for what you want to do, you are going to get backlash from your external world that you've created. Like you've never experienced. You know, we talk about this, it's called the terror barrier in, uh, in the workshops. So as you're coming up and making this decision to move forward, to go after what you want, you are going to get pushback from the universe, from spirit, from people, what, however you want to define it. Um, you are going to get pushback from the world that you have created for yourself like you've never experienced. And that is the moment that you need to push forward harder than ever to get through all of that noise onto the other side where it's quiet and serene and you're actually living that new reality. And once you're in that new reality, you need to enjoy the fact that you were there. You need to appreciate the fact that you were there, that you've overcome a major hurdle. And that way, when you, when you do all of that, you won't go back to your previous reality. It's almost impossible to, to slip back to where you were. Now, <clears throat> a lot of people will do that, but it scares them so much that they have to manage and now be self-reliant or self-responsible in this new reality <laughs> that they'll go back to their old comfort levels, which is very, very common. So anytime you break through, you need to still do a lot of work to stay there. And as you do this process over and over and over, again, I've been doing it for 43 years of my life, so it's very easy for me to do. <clears throat> but for others, you know, I remember when I started doing it, stepping out of the, the mold I created for myself, um, I got a lot of pushback from myself, from my friends, from family, from just external uh, experiences, trying to drive me back to that small, safe place. And I just kept going forward and forward and forward and never let myself stop. And I've really become very good at handling all of that. And that's how you can do it as well. It's not an easy process. Um, nothing in growth is easy. It takes a lot of work, a tremendous amount of dedication, a, tre a tremendous amount of consistency. And if you're not willing to do that, you're not going to get as far as you want to go. So that's what, that's really what it boils down to is, is stepping through that, that root fear, enjoying the place that you got yourself to. And that's another key. You have to enjoy it. If you don't, you're going to go right back. And once you're there enjoying it and experiencing that new reality, then uh, work to stay there. And then it's on to the next one. And then it becomes easier and easier and easier each time you do it. I want you guys to hear all the fearless principles he's talking about here. Like you don't need to know how, like soon it asked, how do I, 
practically create these opportunities. You don't need to know how. You just need to choose it, and then you need to take the step that's in front of you, which is what he keeps doing. He doesn't know all the steps. He just I okay. I don't. I've um, never known. I've never known a single step that I was taking other than the one I'm currently taking. I, I just never have, and I have an end goal, but you know, I may walk a very, very squirrely path to get to that end goal. It's not a straight line path. That's, that doesn't work. So yeah, you're going to be all over the place. You're going to be challenged from so many different directions. Like your core beliefs are going to be rocked if you really want to make something of yourself and you have to be okay with that. Yeah, this is super, super important. This is the mistake everybody makes. They chase comfort and security and then they make it their life goal to be safe. And then that, because of that, they don't have a life. So Dave is, is uncomfortable being too comfortable. And I want you guys yeah. to hear that. <laughs> like if he sits around like the average person and, and tries to get a comfortable job, I met him and he had a good comfortable job. He was going nuts. You know, um, he had to get out of it. And, uh, and I'm kind of the same way. He, he does it with more extreme sports stuff. But, but uh, you know, being comfortable can get really uncomfortable for people that love to grow but for people that don't love to grow they want everything to stay the same day in day out and then they're miserable for it um so that just notice that in dave's personality and the way he talks um that that it's it's super important you just need to know your starting point and your end point and you can create anything if you're willing to be uncomfortable and you get addicted to breakdown to breakthroughs which really just become breakthroughs or breakthroughs now i want to ask you dave have you noticed because you talked about this briefly that as you become more successful in life, um, that success comes to you. Uh, it gets offered, like you were talking about, how you were offered trips. As you become more successful, you're offered more things for free, right? Yes, you're offered more absolutely. Things for and a lot of people think that's unfair, but that's exactly how law works. As you get a more abundant mindset and you focus on success and you focus on expansion, uh, because your focus internally is on expansion and success, you get more stuff for free. You're rewarded by the universe for being that way. This is why celebrities get given so much shit. This is why successful people are given all kinds of opportunities because they're creating so much value. The world wants to give back to them, whether the value is just entertainment or otherwise. And, and so you've seen that in your life pretty, pretty clearly. Yeah, many, many, many times. Um, I think it really started the first experience I had of it was – when I was uh, still a ski instructor, when I was in my teenage years, um, you know, I, I didn't grow up with any kind of money at all and skiing was very expensive for me. But I had a friend who, his father worked with the ski companies and he was a rep. So I never paid the, the retail costs for ski equipment ever in my life, I've never have. And that's when I first experienced, oh, because I'm a solid person, because I do what I say I'm gonna do, this was offered to me. And it's never stopped um, when it comes to sports you're, stuff. You're also out there taking a lot of risk on the skis, looking like a badass, making everybody wanna own the skis you're on. Sure, I mean, and that's the way sponsorship works. <laughs> yeah, I've had, a lot of, I've had a lot of sponsors throughout my, uh, my sports and athletic career, if you will. Um, it's, it's been very nice. Um, you know, I've even had some, some cash inflow, which is great. I mean, when I was com competing with uh, mountain biking all over the country, I mean, people were paying my, my flights and paying my race entry fees and things like that. So that was really cool. Um, and then it just kept expanding as I kept expanding and offering more and more value to people. And the value for the Australia trips was my character and who I am but also my skydiving skills. And this guy wanted a specific type of character. He wanted somebody that could skydive and, and deliver what he was looking for for his travel channel. And I had met him when I was on a, a trip in LA. And next thing I know, he's calling me up to, to fly me out and a bunch of other people to, uh, to Australia and, and do some work for him. So that's the way it works. I, I provided the value of skydiving for him because that's what he was looking for. And I provided the value of, of my integrity and who I am and, and what I'm about in my character uh, for him. In, in turn, that was worth the price that he paid to, to send me out there three times. 
So he also, he also sent me to New Zealand, which was on one of those three trips. So it's pretty cool getting flown internationally for free and, and being put up in, you know, $2 million houses. And I mean, it, it's cool, but um, you need to, you need to be providing something for that. I love it. And, and I had a dream and I, we've realized it together, me and you, I just was thinking about it because you were talking about how you create your own reality. And I heard this dream from David Nagel, uh, one of our mentors. David Nagel said, oh, well, I wanted to create a reality where I travel with all my friends all around, all over the place. We stay in the best hotels and we, 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 go, we go to different cities together that we love to go to and we, and we work together and yet we travel all, all together. We, we literally did that. I realized that years ago. We have our team of great friends. We travel, we take them to New York, we take them to Miami, we take them to Europe, we take them to, and we just literally, I can't tell you how many cities I've been in with you and the whole team all over the world. And it's freaking awesome. And we literally have created this global lifestyle that, 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 that very, most people dream about just by traveling to these places and literally creating value over and over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. And in turn, because the coaches are there helping us, you know, of course they get paid, but they're also, they also are getting their flights covered, right? Which is value to us. And in turn, they're already in Europe, so they can go explore very cheap on their own outside of work hours to, to other countries. So it's, it's such a win-win for them and, and a great value to them. And I love to see that they, they go out and explore. I think it's awesome because it's, you know, it's what I've done my whole life. And, and I really appreciate when they take the opportunity to do so. I love it. Um, okay, let's dive into your questions now. I, I asked one of them already and maybe we covered some of these, we'll see. But guys, if you got questions for Dave, make sure you post them in the Q&A box and not in the chat box because a lot of you guys post your questions in the chat box and uh, it's the Q&A box that I look at. Um, the chat box is for you guys to have discussions with the background coaches and, and each other. Uh, Russell, when, um, hi Dave, when uh, you're in a state of overwhelm or confusion, lack of clarity, how do you cut through the noise and figure out your next step to take right now? Can you talk about the process you use to figure out what's next and if this is in fact the right one to take? That's an awesome question. I really, I really like that question. And it is a very, very tricky thing to do. First, you need to accept the overwhelm. You need to accept the confusion. You need to accept the chaos. You need to take everything that you're disliking about that situation and let it in and ground it. And if, you, if you've done work with us, you know what grounding is and you know how to do that. You really need to just accept everything that's coming at you first because you can't make a decision, you can't listen to yourself if you're worried about everything that you dislike. You have to, to let yourself starting to start liking what you dislike. And then from that point onward, then you really wanna tune into what your guttural instinct is. And this is what most of our society is missing these days is guttural instinct. They say, oh yeah, I listened to it. But if you really start studying your guttural instinct and listening to your gut, the actual answer that your gut gave you was like 10 steps before you actually made your decision, but you ignored it and went to your logical mind to try to figure things out. And the gut instinct is gonna go against your ego and it's gonna feel like this is the wrong thing to do. And sometimes you cannot see the right direction it's leading you until much later on. So listening to the gut following the instincts that, that, you, that it's telling you to, uh, to use and go toward is excellent. Now, you also have logical data that you need to run as well. And there are, what you need to do is be calm enough to look and sort through all that data that you're being given to make a decision between listening to your gut and then the, the data that you are given logically. And that's how I do everything. I take all the data in, which is a very analytical process, right? It's not a very embodied process. It's a lot of crunching information in the mind. And then I let that decipher through my body and, and listen for the first instinctual hit I get in my gut and then make the decision. So the information comes in through my head, I process it, then it drops into my gut and my gut is, I listen to what my gut says. 
And when I start moving in that direction from the gut, then my logical mind will start kicking back in saying, oh no, this, that. And part of that's ego trying to keep you safe. Um, so you have to ignore that stuff and listen to what your gut has told you and then move forward from there. And I, I have really worked on developing that even more so um, in the past, I'd say half a decade than I ever have in my entire life. And it's paid dividend big time. So that's kind of how I do everything when, when shit hits the fan, so to speak. And this is a huge piece that everybody misses. They think they want to be intuitive. I hear it all the time. So they just make intuitive decisions, but they don't put the information in the computer to make an intuitive decision about. It doesn't mean you have to analyze all the information, but you have to put it in. I've heard many successful billionaires talk about this process. Um, I've heard um, Branson talk about, I make decisions on my gut, but that's all he says. But before he makes a decision, he also, if you look at his process, he listens to what everybody has to say and then lets yeah. him crunch that. Um, he doesn't sit and have to break it all down. So great, great example. I think it's super important. I remember when we started this company, I remember you had all these charts on the walls when we, so when we were first building up and, and there was numbers everywhere. And I was like, I love it. Cause you were sitting there reading all the numbers, but then we weren't sitting there stressing over them. Just like we just have them there. And it was really good to see them all over the walls and, and, uh, and to see, oh, this is what's happening here. This is what's happening there. So. Yeah, absolutely. Because then you then you can start testing things and then like really getting your gut in, in alignment with where your ultimate end goal is. And it'll just guide you right there. And it, and it has year after year, uh, event after event for me. And uh, so that's why I really, really listen to it um, incredibly well. Nice. I love it. Uh, by the way, Jonathan, uh, somebody said that we're not streaming live on Facebook. So if you can double check that, I sent you a message. Didn't know if you got it. Thank you. Um, okay, let's continue on. Um, what are some of the things you released on or let go of uh, an attachment to in exchange for more travel? So what's there something you let go of a lower nature so you could have this higher nature thing in your perception? A lot, a lot of it was just material possessions, whether it would be a motorcycle, a mountain bike, a car, um, you know, I, I've sold kayaks, like, I mean, just what, what whatever. Um, most of it's material. <laughs> I see Eric says, don't sell the Unimog. Sorry, buddy. That, that is my one regret in life, but I'll get another one. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've let go of all these material things to get the cash to go have travel experiences and life experiences, because to me, they're much more important than this material item that I have right then and there. I can always go buy more material items. That's, that's never been something that has uh, held me back because I know that uh, we, we live in a world of abundance. I mean, we live in the U.S., so there's plenty of everything to go around. Um, even, even during COVID-19, there's plenty of stuff to go around. Um, so I, I've never really Unless thought of- toilet paper in there. No, that's not enough. <laughs> exactly. I, I've never really- thought of things in lack. I've always thought of like, how, how do I, how do I make this happen? Um, how do I, uh, how do I feel abundant about this? I mean, those weren't the words going through my mind, but like I was seeking abundance to go and have these experiences. And, and that's the material things that was um, a, a way of releasing attachment. So that was, that was interesting because some of the things I realized when I sold them, I was more attached to them than I thought. Um, and so through that whole process, I would let go of my attachments to those things. Now on an emotional level, um, things that I, that weren't involving material possessions, but just, um, just my, uh, personal bullshit. Of course, there's always fears of the unknown, right? There's always, um, needing to have faith that things are going to work out even kind of in like the darkest hour. And I'm not saying I've ever had like the darkest hour moments, um, it's all relative, right? And I, well, you, I you, uh, you've had those two experiences where you almost died. And well, I, yeah, I really don't even consider them like the dark moments. I mean, I'm talking like atrocities. You literally, you, know? you literally, well, come on, you literally were underwater and you surrendered and said, okay, this is it, I'm going to die. And that's when you got three, right? Yes. That, yeah, that, that, I mean, that, that, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, that was an amazing experience. Of course, because I'm here talking about it, but in the moment, it was sheer terror. Um, and then, uh, and then I surrendered to that moment, um, and it was one of the most blissful experiences I've ever had in my entire life. So, uh, 
I'm always, I guess, on a subconscious level, trying to chase that, that peace and serenity inside uh, myself that I experienced in that moment. Um, so yeah, no, that's a, <laughs> that's an interesting one. <laughs> It's a very good one. Um, and I, I love what you said. It was really good. Um, a lot of people really get attached to physical things and material things. So you got to let go of your internal beliefs and stories to grow. Uh, and you're also got to let, let go of your physical things. And I find people that are stuck in the lower end of emotions get really attached to the things they own. Where Dave is sitting here saying, I valued experience way more than I valued material things. And that's why I'm at where I'm at now, because the experience has grown him. And then he can go back and buy the material things again if he wants. And Half the time, you probably don't even want it back. Exactly. I was just getting ready to say, like, I, you know, I have a list of things that I uh, that I want, and I and I look at them regularly, and and I still like, do I identify with these things? Do I still really want these things? And uh, there's several things on the list that I'm I'm going to uh, to cross off because I I just don't identify with them anymore. It's not what I'm it's not what I'm chasing inside anymore. It's not anything that resonates with me anymore. Beautiful. Let's go on to the next question so we can get through some of these. Um, um, how did you meet the Prince of Jordan? Did you directly approach him? Did you, did you do it? What, which what opener did you use? No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> did you directly approach him in his network to meet him or was using your skill set of stepping into the fear of skydiving that led you to meet him? Just wondering. Ultimately, it was, ultimately it was stepping into my fear of falling out of airplanes and starting to skydive. The whole story of meeting the Prince of Jordan is in and of itself um, a true test of the unknown, uh, faith in the unknown, in my willingness to just keep going in the unknown. Um, I was supposed to meet up with some people in Jordan. It was my first trip to the Middle East. Uh, this was way back in 2015 when, you know, ISIS was going crazy in that area. Uh, when I landed in Jordan, Jordan there were two cities that still had a lot, of, a lot of ISIS activity in them. Um, I had some friends uh, from the State Department there. They, they kind of briefed me of where to go and not where to go in the country, or where not to go in the country. Um, and I was supposed to meet up with some folks and travel together as a group. Um, that didn't happen. I was there on my own. Um, again, not knowing much about the Middle East. Um, it was kind of like a, a scary thing, especially during those times. Um, with a lot of uh, the the terrorist activity going on, a lot of uh, Syrian ref refugees down in um, in uh, Jordan. You guys do realize I've taken an insurance policy out of my business partner, right? <laughs> Just saying. So um, yeah, it was it was interesting times to be in the Middle East, and I'm traveling alone all through the country. A lot of the road networks aren't actually marked appropriately. I had paper maps and Google maps and roads were not where they said they were because they had been moved. And, you know, I'm trying to navigate through the country, not knowing kind of who's friend or foe because I, I didn't have enough in, information to determine like, you know, is, is this gendarmery that's stopping me? Are they friend or foe? Or is this somebody impersonating someone and, and I'm going to get shot or whatever? Like, I, I didn't know. And so I had a couple experiences like that. And there's a lot of military presence in that country. It's just something that we're not used to here in the States, but in the Middle East, it's very prominent. And um, so, you know, I'm processing all these fears and all this craziness and, and I'm driving out to the Dead Sea because that's where this skydiving um, event was going on. Stay at the Dead Sea, um, go to the drop zone in the morning and I'm jumping and I get in the plane with this guy and I noticed they had the, he had the uh, Jordanian uh, royal family uh, crest embroidered onto his skydive rig. I was like, hmm, this is interesting. That's like the crest of the royal family. And there's three of us jumping together. So we did a jump together, all three of us. And then I landed and then he just kind of like disappears. And then there's this whole entourage around him and he immediately comes out of the, the hangar with another parachute packed, ready to go. And he's getting back on the plane. And I'm like, what the hell? I was like, that's kind of strange. Um, so I talked to my friends like, oh yeah. So we just did a jump with the uh, Prince of Jordan. I was like, no way. And uh, yeah, he was really excited to jump with, with you. The fact that you were an American there visiting Jordan. 
Um, so the next two jumps we did, it was much more fun. We had a great time. And then afterwards, uh, we talked. He was, he was asking, like, why I was in Jordan. I told him I came here to skydive, check out the Dead Sea, check out the country. And then I was going further south in Jordan down to the Red Sea to go scuba diving. And so he thought it was really cool that I came to visit Jordan. We talked and exchanged some, um, exchanged some, uh, you know, cultural stuff about, uh, you know, each other's country. And lo and behold, his sister was attending UCLA at the time. <laughs> so I thought, thought that was pretty funny. So we, we had talked about Los Angeles because he had been there before. And ultimately, that's how I met him, through skydiving. And he... Um, was like, let's get some pictures together. And so we did that. And it was just, it was a really, really cool experience to have, hang out with him and his whole entourage and, and um, continue going through the country. And because I had a picture of him, this is a funny, a quick funny story. I'm checking into my hotel in Aqaba. And if anybody's been in the Middle East, if you go into pretty much any hotel, it's like going through airport security just to get into the hotel because of just the amount of terrorism that's there. So I'm like taking my skydive parachute through the check-in process at um, at uh, this hotel. The guys stop, they jump back away from the x-ray machine, and they call me over, they're like freaking out. And um, they thought there was a bomb inside of my parachute. And so they were trying to ask me in very broken English what it was and what was going on. And I, and I told them that I was just like, how am I going to get out of this? Because I don't speak Arabic or any, you know, any of the languages in the Middle East. So I pulled up my phone with my picture with the prince and showed it to him and showed him that I was skydiving with him. And from that second on, like they had called staff over from the front desk, escorted me to the front desk, escorted me to the room, took my bags and everything up to the room, invited me to some private party on the rooftop for this restaurant opening. I mean, it was just ridiculous. But Again, because I was showing them value, they perceived the prince as, as very valuable. Um, I got treated very well. So uh, that's, that's kind of how I met the prince and the story of the prince and, and everything else. And the story gets even crazier. No, I don't want to say crazier, but equally as crazy the rest of the time I'm in Jordan as well. So it was, it was an amazing experience, but it was also a very stressful and scary experience because of... Uh, because of the activity of the terrorism and the level of terrorism that was going on in the country at the time. But um, I, I never had felt more alive in my life presently than I did when I was traveling through there because all my senses were turned on to like 100%. Yeah, and that's when we get too comfortable, we don't feel alive anymore. And that's why it's so important to step out of your comfort zone. You need time for rest and then recovery and time for stressing the body and growing it, the same as we do with building muscles. And you're, you're demonstrating that right here. That's what makes us feel alive. Um, Daniel's got a question. And Daniel's on every call. He's always, uh, he's super consistent. I uh, love having him on these calls. Um, this is, this is good. Yep, it is. <laughs> Hi, Dave and Brian. Jonathan Turner spoke yesterday about how you should plan your life from the end perspective. Yet, oftentimes, you only discover what you want and what you want to be through uh, through a long process of experimentation and following your instincts. So how can you know where you want to be in 20 years if your whole life until now you've lived in a small fake reality without even getting in touch with yourself? Well, you just kind of stated it right there. You, you've acknowledged that you're living in a small fake reality. So what's the big reality? What's the big goal? What's the, uh, the vision that you truly have for yourself? That's what you need to be going after. You need to be moving in that direction and again, there is no straight line path. You're going to go explore lots of things. I've explored so many different types of jobs, careers, um, travel, everything that, that's really helped me mold me into who I am and become very confident and solid in who I am. That, that way I'm able to set goals that are pretty far out there and achieve them. But what's important from where you're standing right now is to do exactly what you just said, go out and explore with the end goal, even if it's just at dream level or fantasy level right now, just hold it there in your intention, uh, in the intention of, of achieving it. E even if you think it's crazy, 
you still want to, but, but you identify with it, right? So like if you have a, a life goal that's crazy, but you still identify it and it really means something to you, who cares what anybody else thinks? Hold that goal with intention and do everything you can to achieve that goal. Now you're gonna go probably a hundred different places before you even come remotely close to achieving that goal. And that's beautiful because those are the places that you need to go to be able to become the person that you want to become to achieve that level of um, status in life or lifestyle. You know, there's an old saying that says, you know, we, we put all the uh, top shelf stuff on the top shelf for a reason because you need to become someone to achieve the level of finance to, to buy the top shelf items. And um, if you want to live a top shelf life, you, you have to do the work, you have to grow, you have to invest the money, you have to uh, take the risk to develop into a person that is worthy of achieving those high level goals. Nice. Um, the next question is actually basically the same. So I think we're going to skip it and I'll, I'll, I'll read it and see if you want to uh, say anything else. What if you don't know what you really want and how do you find, find it? So that's pretty much the same thing. Um, if we go down to Ivan, how do you solve bad habits? I have many goals, but I tend to get distracted by Facebook, porn, video games, <laughs> things so you can reach your goals, but I can reach my goal. So those are all what I like to call weapons of mass distraction. Yeah, so what's that? I've never heard you say that. I like that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what they are. Um, social media, TV, all that stuff. It's, it's, they're mass distractions and, and they're weapons used against you, right? And um, they suck you in and they're very good at it. I... You know, I love my social media like everybody else does. It's fun. It's fun to, to, and easy to keep connected with people. And it's fun to, you know, put your lifestyle out there. And, you know, and I enjoy doing it. And I love sharing my experiences to hopefully inspire others. Um, again, if you guys want to follow me on social media, I'm on Facebook, on Instagram. And um, so you can, you can follow along and hit me up. And you can see what I'm talking about because the pictures I showed you is just a, a blip on the radar. And you can go through and look at all the stuff I've done with my life. Um, but really, uh, let's see. What, what was the, at the point of the question again? I got a little off there. Um, how do I get, how do I solve the bad habits? That I have? Oh, solve the bad habits. That's right. That's right. We were, we were talking about the bad yeah. habits, but not how to solve them. Um, so yeah, we all have bad habits in, in some way, shape or form, right? Bad habits could be drinking, bad habits could be smoking, bad habits could be not working out enough, bad habits could be uh, not having a proper diet. So what you want to need, what you need to do, and this is with any change in a habit, is you need to identify what it is first. You have to acknowledge that you have these bad habits. Then you can work on, and you're going to slip up continuously until you really bring it into your conscious mind that you really want change. And you can catch yourself on a conscious level, not subconscious level, but on a conscious level that, oh, I'm in this pattern that's bad for me. And then whatever you're doing that's bad for you, stop it immediately. And then the next day it comes along, you'll probably go back and run into the same issue again right? Did you catch it a little bit sooner? Hopefully you did. If you didn't, that's okay too. Just the fact that, again, you brought it to your conscious mind. So therefore you're going to um, be able to stop this habit again and again. And what you do is you just keep going over and over and over again on these bad habits and catching them in your conscious mind more and more frequently than you did in the past and catching them before before you even actually do the action. And when you're getting in that range, you're, you're able to kill the habit usually. And if you fall off the wagon, again, get back up, make a conscious effort. Look, hey, I, I, I made this mistake. I'm going to stop it again. And eventually over time, you will be able to eradicate that habit. But it does take a lot of work. It's not easy to do. I want to um, ask a question that's not in the Q&A, but somebody kind of posted a statement 
in uh, the chat, and I thought it was an interesting statement. He said, Grant wrote, in a, anyone in LA want to brainstorm and do some tension stuff like skydiving once this quarantine ends? And the quarantine might be going on for who knows how long. Uh, and I see, I hear a fundamental flaw in that question he's asking everybody. Do, do you want to talk about it? Because I know you hear it. I can see you. <laughs> Is there, what was the question again? What did he write? Um, uh, da, 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 where'd he go? Anyone in LA want to brainstorm and do some tension stuff like skydiving once this quarantine ends? <laughs> well, first of all, there's no brainstorming to go skydiving. You just show up in the drop zone and you jump out of the plane. So there's nothing to brainstorm on that. And quarantine's going to end. Uh, end the story. <laughs> yeah, the question I, I would ask is, what can you do right now? What can you do today? Like, I saw this video of... This guy sure. sitting on the balcony playing the keyboard to everybody in his neighborhood from his balcony and waving to everybody. And somebody else joined in with a guitar on another balcony. And you can be yelling hi to people from a distance, from your car window. There's so much you can do. I mean, I, I'm just thinking about it. I don't know what you got there, but. Yeah, I mean, if, if, you, if you want to do something now that's tension-based, go find something that's tension-based. You know, maybe it's walking around without a mask on. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> now don't be don't be crazy jesus yeah. yeah don't be don't be that crazy but um yeah what what can you do now that's gonna put yourself into some type of tension that you're like whoa this is a little crazy you know maybe it's flirting with more girls on tinder if that's what you're what you're doing i i you know i don't know um maybe it, maybe you're you had started dating a girl before uh, this whole thing happened and you, you lost touch with her because of this and the quarantining, maybe you hit her up again. Um, and, and just do something that you can do within this environment to build, build some tension. Maybe you, oh, I love what you're saying. This is perfect because what they could do is they could get together as a group, get on zoom and pull up each other's tenders and practice working together as a group to brainstorm and push people to say stuff that's outside their comfort zone. And, sure. And and hear their nice guy syndromes and say stuff that's more bold and see if they can get girls onto um, virtual dates on Zoom, like live virtual dates on Zoom and yeah. Skype and stuff from all around the world. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, personally, if 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 I was if I were still single, I definitely would not be um, staying home. I can promise you that. <laughs> that's me personally. <laughs> there you go. And um, I would I would personally be out dating and the, that would, this would not stop me but um and and i would definitely still be flirting online and everything else right so um it's it's um I, i'll tell you guys a, a very quick story you know everybody's like oh you know all these dating apps right before there was even dating apps there was you know the aim chat rooms i was flirting with girls on those back in the day and i actually got a girl to send me a picture of her and i went and met her that was my very first experience of, uh, of uh, online dating, so to speak. And that was way back in the day, probably like 94 or something like that. So um, super funny, super funny story. I love it because you can really practice your banter and your tension pushing and all that <laughs> stuff. On, on, on the, and, there's, and you've got an endless supply of potential people to talk to. So. Yeah, yeah, it was, it, it's great. I mean, it, it's a, it's an excellent way, you know, if guys aren't, you know, really comfortable with uh, their texting skills and things like that. Now's a great time to start, start doing things like that. Because all the girls are on the board right now. I'm getting match after match from all around the world. Cause there's so many bored girls and I just, I, I'm not really, I don't really use Tinder much, but I look at the, I see all these matches coming in and then I kind of ignore them cause I don't really like Tinder, but if I was really needed to work on some skill, that's where I'd be. Yeah, you you, um, you can see these days right now that uh, a lot of people are very, very bored. And, and this kind of brings up another point, right? Before CD19, everybody's like, oh, I don't have the time. I don't have the time. I don't have the time, you know? And, oh, I'm so busy. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. Really? No, you weren't. You were just highly distracted by all of the things that we just talked about and you really weren't doing anything. And now that you have all of this time to, to use at your disposal, to grow, to be uh, um, something better than you have been, you're sitting around saying, oh, I'm bored, I'm bored. Um, I don't like to sit around and I, and I haven't been sitting around. I've been 
you know, working to change fearless to help you guys out to, you know, look at all the options we have to grow the business, to keep, you know, working with you guys and um, keep putting out content and helping you guys through this and helping shape your mindsets through this event. And I've also gone and um, looked at some other, other options to make other investments of money in this time. I've, I've not been wasting my time at all. And uh, I've been exploring the opportunity to learn something new every day if I can. And I, I definitely have not been wasting time. So be sure you're not wasting time in this moment because when this moment's over and you get back to life, you're going to go right back to the same thing of, oh, well, I don't have the time. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. Well, what happened for the past two months? You didn't do anything and you could have handled all of the stuff that you wanted to get handled, but you chose not to because you'd rather be distracted and bored. So make sure you're using your time very, very wisely because in my mind, this, this whole situation, sure, it's bizarre, it's weird, it's frustrating, it can be annoying, but it's also a gift. It's a wonderful gift to chill out, to relax, to regroup, to say, okay, what do I really want? And let go of all the distractions and really dive deep to figure out where you're going to go in the next 20 years from this point. I love that because uh, I, I have the same thing. I can't understand. If I didn't have a job, I still wouldn't be bored. There's so many things I'm constantly learning, doing, working on um, that uh, I don't see how you can get bored. Um, I don't get these people who retire and they, like, I don't know what to do with my life. I'm like, learn a foreign language, travel, you know, build. There's so much to do. Um, it's incredible. Absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, how do you know if it's gut instinct or if it's logical? Well, if you're up here crunching data, it's logical. <laughs> if you feel something in your gut down by, you know, by your belly button, your, uh, you know, your solar plexus, that's, that's gut instinct telling you what to do. But if you're in your head crunching data, that's not the place to make decisions. Yeah, you got to feel your body, buddy. L L Eckhart Tolle's power of now is good for feeling your body. We have some movement programs, yoga, as long as the teacher is not teaching his exercise. You know, learn to feel your body because your body will tell you the difference. Um, okay, this one's anonymous. How do you coach the naturally risk-averse clients when their terror barrier track record is either non-existent or not so great? Even just hearing Dave discuss how he leads his life, I feel very uncomfortable and just can't relate to all uh, to all the advice, do you take a different track with them and how they start to learn how to handle risk? Sure. We just start with a much smaller risk. You, I, somebody that, that is, has a, a very risk adverse personality, a very fear-based personality, as much as I want to take you up an airplane and throw you out of it. Um, that's not something that, you, that we would do. We want to, take and have you do little tiny steps first. So you build the confidence within yourself to handle risk on your own. So for someone like yourself, that would be the path. It's like, okay, take this little risk. Now do you feel confident doing that? Yes, I do. Okay, let's increase the risk just a tiny bit and, and accomplish that. Okay, great, I feel that comfortable there. And then you just keep moving forward, baby steps and baby steps eventually you'll build a solid foundation within yourself around risk tolerance, around fear-based mentalities, and you'll start taking bigger risks on your own and um, really feeling a great sense of personal confidence. And really, when it comes down to it, people that are risk adverse, that are fear-based, they just don't have confidence. And the confidence comes from knowing who you are by going out and having experiences. Um, it's kind of the whole chicken before the egg, right? Um, it is, uh, it, it's very important that you go out and have experiences and build confidence from them. Even if they're tiny little experiences, you don't have to go out and do all the wild stuff I've done. This is something that has been in me since I was a tiny little kid. Um, but somebody that has, may has, may have lived through, you know, some type of atrocity, say maybe a war torn country or something like that. And, and they have a massive amount of fear and um, are afraid to take risks because everything in their life was fear. 
um, then you start out with just, like I said, very small baby steps and work yourself forward from there, one step at a time. And that's the, that's the only way that anybody can get through this is just one step at a time. You may take a baby step. I'm taking the same step, but I just may, may take a bigger step. And that's, that's the only difference. There's no difference between my risk taking and fear based, uh, fear based mentality and in, in handling that versus yours. Um, I'm just taking a, a bigger chunk of the pie. That's all. Oh, can't, uh, can't hear you there, Brian. There we go. That should be better. Um, yeah, I see a lot of great comments in the chat stuff. People are really, uh, really enjoying it um okay next question from coca how can i gain more self-worth in order to do things badly knowing people will criticize me i'm gonna read that again how can i gain more self-worth in order to do things badly knowing people will criticize me so i, I think he wants to be comfortable being bad at stuff so he can learn and grow because he's afraid to, he's afraid to be bad at something because he's afraid of being criticized is what it looks like ah oh, okay <clears throat> well What's really important is to go out and do lots of bad stuff that, and, and mess things up because in that moment of being uncomfortable, you're going to learn to be comfortable and learn to not care what people think and let go of the judgments that, are pe that people are making and that uh, you feel that they're making. Uh, a lot of this stuff, again, when I go back to my story, right, these are projections that people are, that that maybe even you are putting on yourself that aren't true. Most people are not really paying attention to you. We just think that they are. And that's not, what's important is you go out and prove that to yourself. So go out and do something foolish or do something that may trigger you and look around. Do people really care? Do people really pay attention to you? Most likely not. And that's one thing that a lot of guys that come and do the workshops with us when they're doing social exercises are very afraid of. Like, oh, what if this person thinks this or feels that or, or says something to me? It's like, they're not going to remember two minutes from now, I promise you that. And to kind of prove this point, look how hard celebrities and people in the entertainment industry have to work to maintain their presence in the public eye because people just forget. And most musicians, um, if they're not out there and they're not the center of attention, most people don't even remember them. They don't, even if they're famous, they're just kind of like, oh yeah, I remember them. It's just, we have so much information coming at us that it, it doesn't matter these days. And you really have to work hard to be in the public eye and, and make something of yourself. It, it's a full-time job. So yeah, go out there, have fun. Let go of all the worries and the preconceived ideas that people are um, going to make fun of you, or even if they do make fun of you, who cares? Um, just take it in, you know, feel what it's like and, and do some releasing on it if you know how to do the releasing. And that's going to build your confidence in uncomfortable situations. Awesome. Um, okay, this one's from Cece. Uh, apparently so it looks like it's somebody that knows you. Uh, can you talk about the advanced helicopter piloting test story? The advanced helicopter piloting test story? Is that the one from Chile when I filmed you taking off maybe? Maybe. Um, I remember the helicopter getting a little, uh, squirrely and we were about to take cover <laughs> behind a car. <laughs> Oh, uh, it's from That's Charles. Okay. That's I, I, see, I see it here now. Uh, you're talking about taking an advanced. Oh, Char it's Charles, Charles Akeke. That's who's answering the question, asking the question there. <laughs> Charles, is that the story you're asking about? The one from Chile um, where we had a little video we put up on, on Facebook. I, I took the video of Dave was flying. Yeah. I, I'm not doing any, uh, any advanced training right now. Um, you know, it was still just like normal training. But to me, uh, flying in the mountains of Chile <laughs> was advanced training with the fact that I've been flying very little amount of time. And uh, it, was inc it was an incredibly scary experience. Um, and I think I know where Charles is going. With you had this. that crazy instructor that was like, ah, just take the controls. I don't care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what Charles is saying right now. I see it. So I, um, 
I did a, a mountain flying lesson in Chile and I had gotten into the helicopter with, uh, with the pilot. He's a military pilot, very accomplished pilot, had about, I think it was 30,000 hours of flying time between commercial jets and helicopters. I get in the helicopter with him and uh, he's like, you know, great, great to see you. He's like, all right, let's take off and, uh, and go. And I had never taken off in a helicopter before. I'd flown it, but I'd never done any hover work or never done any takeoffs or landings. And I get in there and he goes, uh, he goes, you're a pilot, right? I said, no, and you know that. And he's like, yeah, you are. He's like, you know how the controls work? I said, yes, I do. He said, okay, then take off. And I said, I don't know how to take off. He's like, yes, you do. And then he would go over the controls with me. What's this one do? What's this one do? What's this one do? And I told him, he's like, okay, so you know how they work. So start moving them. And, so, and he made me take off in the helicopter. He made me bring it up into a hover. He made me take off and do, and, and do the, the appropriate takeoff. And I was like freaking out because I, you know, it's the first time I've ever flown with this instructor. So I didn't have the trust in him that I needed to have, which was again, me going into the unknown, not knowing that this guy, clearly I knew he had a lot of skill, but I was like, okay, this guy's kind of crazy. He's letting me do whatever he wants, uh, whatever I want. And so what he would do is let me get to the verge of being out of control. And he would hop on the controls very quickly, bring it back into uh, the appropriate flight path and then let go again and let me mess it up again. And he would let this thing get out of control and then bring it back into control for a split second, give it back to me. So I learned, I don't even want to say I learned, I attempted to hover and uh, did a very bad job at it and then and, and took off, which is not easy to do in a helicopter at all. And as we were up flying, um, he was teaching me how to fly the helicopter and giving me a tour at the same time. Uh, it was the craziest experience I've ever had. Uh, the guy's skill set was phenomenal. He would just give me a point, an idea, a reference, and he'd go, go fly there, go do this, go do that. And he wanted to let me see how I did it. And then he would come in and change at the very last moment when the thing was getting completely out of control. Uh, he would change what needed to be changed and then give it right back to me. And that flight was one of the most beautiful, terrifying, and uh, wildest flights I've ever done in a helicopter. But it was also the biggest confidence building um, flight I'd ever done in my entire life, um, which I haven't done a lot. So um, it was an amazing, amazing experience for me to let myself, and, and I think this is the kind of metaphor that Charles was getting at, let myself get completely out of control um, let myself explore the space of what the helicopter could do. And then with a professional coach um, or instructor would bring it back into alignment and he would just keep course correcting me the whole way so that I really developed the appropriate skill set to fly the helicopter in the mountainous terrain. And it was a phenomenal experience, but it was also a very scary experience. So as you know, moving forward, as you can imagine, you're going to get out of control when you do things you don't know how to do. Uh, and that's okay. Just bring them back into alignment to the place where you are comfortable and then get them out of control again. And then bring them back and get out of control and bring them back. And as you do this, you'll be able to begin, begin, uh, begin creating a lot of self-confidence in who you are, what you're about in risk management. Your, uh, your mic's off there again, Brian. There we go. I had to get back to the right screen. I was, I was taking a quick note and uh, screwed myself up there a little bit. Um, okay, so we got a couple more questions here. Uh, one's from Miklos. Um, hey, Dave, what do you think about enlightenment and self-realization? I'm super curious what you say here. What do I think about enlightenment and self-realization? <clears throat> I'm going to start with self-realization. Self-realization is, to me, like self-responsibility. It's incredibly important. Um, I think it should be one of our main focuses in life to understand who we are at the most core level. And as you start to under understand yourself more, 
you're able to create a, a much deeper level of confidence in yourself in very strange situations and, um, and make appropriate decisions and things just kind of work out. But yeah, um, the, the self-realization is critical and, and everybody should be working on that as, as they move forward. Now, when it comes to an enlightenment, I, I think that someone that's truly enlightened, I've never met anyone that's truly enlightened. Um, I feel that they are someone that really knows everything about themselves and has worked very, very hard to alleviate ego as much as possible. Um, you know, you hear, you hear stories of great meditators that, you know, are dying and, and still have things they're working on. So from, you know, from the perspective of truly knowing oneself and being fully enlightened, eh, <laughs> I, uh, I don't know that everybody, anybody's really achieved it. And I think if somebody's sitting there saying that they have achieved it, then they really have it. It's a good, uh, it's a good analogy. There's always, you know, uh, um, Nicholas was just saying this and it's kind of, I believe it's probably true. I've heard this many times, but there's, there's always a few people enlightened on the planet, but they're, they're not the ones you're going to see in the media. They're, they're, what they're doing is they're just simple people usually that are grounding and containing and uh, energy. Exactly. You're keeping the planet from destroying itself, basically. Yes, I, I, I would agree with that. And, and you're right. These people of, of the enlightened sages will say that I've met, um, these are very normal people. They are people that um, you can tell have really limited, I don't know that limit is the right word, but their ego is very, very, um, low. Uh, they really have control over it. They really understand who they are. And I can say that, that some of those people are, are pretty, pretty uh, enlightened to a degree. Um, I don't even know how we would measure true enlightenment. So, um, it's, yeah. it's, like, it's like anything, you know, Hawkins says there's more levels of enlightenment than there is getting to enlightened. And, uh, and, and uh, Eckhart Tolle says that um, you, uh, that enlightenment is sanity and that everything before enlightenment is insanity. And so don't I think of it as a crazy thing. <laughs> think of it as a thing you yeah. sane, you know? So I think the I whole thing. And, and I, I feel that the more and more you get to know who you truly are at the core level, the more crazy the rest of the world seems. Yeah, it's exactly true. And then and to the rest of the world, the enlightened person seems crazy, probably. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because yeah. they don't give a fuck what anybody thinks of them. Uh, exactly. Lester, <laughs> in that category, probably be like Lester Levinson, um, uh, uh, Walter Russell, the, you know, people that have lived in the past that I know of, but um, that I've looked at on video a little bit and checked out. So. Sure, sure. I, I think enlightenment across the board, like to be fully enlightened, I think that's a little crazy, but I think people have achieved um, really, really amazing levels in certain aspects of their lives and lives and certain aspects within themselves that they're able to share it. And I think, you know, Lester was definitely one of those guys. Yeah, he, he, he infected the, or affected the world largely. In a yeah, way. yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay, we got one more question here. Oh, there's actually a few more come in, but um, have you found that your heart is also another part of the body where you get crazy ideas to pursue something that's important to you that your logic tells you otherwise? I, I don't want to say, I mean, the heart is, uh, the heart for me is the joy aspect of it. Um, I, don't, I don't get inspiration from my heart. I get it from my gut because that's pretty much where all the inspiration comes from, like deeper in the gut. Uh, for me personally, the heart is the love of it, the joy of it, and the, and the passion for me. That's what I get out of it um, when it comes to my heart. Um, and then what, what was the other part of that question? It was... Um, have you found that the heart is another part of the body where you get crazy ideas to pursue something that's important to you, to, uh, to you that your logic tells you otherwise. Mm -hmm. hmm. 
No, I, I, for me, that doesn't work for me. I mean, I, I, like I said, I just, I get the joy, the love, the passion out of my heart. And, um, I, I don't get, uh, any inspiration from the heart. I get inspiration from the gut. I get inspiration from sure. Um, processing, uh, ideas and concepts, uh, I'll get inspiration. Um, then it'll drop into my heart and I'll feel like the joy, the love, the passion of wanting to do it. And then it'll drop into my gut and give me uh, direction as to how to do it. That's the best way I can answer that question. Yeah. So it comes down for more from a, a download, like from your, your, uh, your yeah. uh, through the crown chakra, if you were to talk about chakras and then that's if you get a divine idea, if you get in a, but if you get an internal direction as to how to do it, that would be gut. If you fall in love with it, that would be heart. Yeah. And um, to me, the heart is like, it's the battery for to make all this stuff come to life. Cause if you're not happy, you're not enjoying yourself, your heart's not turned on. What's the fucking point anyways? You yeah, know, that's exactly. Exactly. So <laughs> exactly. And I've had, I've had some weird, some weird downloads of information. I'm like, where did I ever come up with this idea? Like I have no clue where that ever came from. And, and it's always, they always come to me when, you know, backs up, your back is up against the wall You've exhausted every possible logical um, solution. You've tried every avenue and you just, it, it really comes from the point where you're like, all right, I'm just going to surrender to this and it is what it is. And that's always been when these like divine <laughs> ideas, if you will, or concepts are downloaded somehow into my, into my consciousness. And I'm like, oh, well, what about this idea? And then I sit and like, it's such a crazy idea. I'm like, where did it come from? And I have no answer for that. I just don't know. And, um, and I go and execute that idea because I'm being told to, and it always works out. Awesome. Um, we have one last question. It's more about a teaching that I give out a lot and you're welcome to take it if you want. Um, uh, but it's an interesting one. So, hi, Dave and Brian. There seems to be a paradoxical teaching from your talks. On one hand, you say there's a lot of hard work uh, going into developing yourself, not hard work, smart work. I agree with this. On the other hand, we write something, uh, supporting statements and affirmations like uh, X comes to me in an easy, relaxed way. So how can you hold two conflicting beliefs and move towards your goals because they're not affirmations. They're, we call that's why we call them supporting statements. But you can say affirmation. Do you want me to answer that, or do you do you have an answer for that? Um, you know, I definitely will let you answer that. Um, I I want to say that life is a paradox, and that's all it's ever been, and that's all it ever will be. So one of the things when students come in and work with us, we teach very paradoxical. Um, because what works in one moment doesn't work in the next and will work in the following moment. Um, we live in a paradox and being able to pick the right solution in a paradoxical world isn't easy. And again, those instincts in the gut are what guide you and help you um, pick the correct solution or the best solution. And maybe you move forward with what you thought was a good direction and all of a sudden you get another hit of like oh shit this isn't the right direction we got to change course and that's where a lot of people mess up like it took me a little while to figure that one out the the gut is like okay you're, you didn't make the right decision i'm going to give you another option here take this route and then you might go that route for a little while and it feels good and then bam you, you hit another spot and you're like oh this isn't the right direction and your gut will tell you to go here and you go that direction that you go a little bit further, further than you've ever gone. And then you start to see things working out slowly over time. But it's a paradox between like, just say those three points. It's like they make no sense logically and they're not going to because again, everything's paradoxical. That's why we have um, these, uh, these uh, polarities that exist, you know? and uh, a good and bad and right and wrong and left and right, like Brian says, and up and down. The, the polarities are a paradox in and of themselves. So yes, it's very confusing, but again, you can handle the paradox as you would trust yourself to move forward through it and don't judge it, just listen to the gut. Great answer, um, because 
It's it's hundred percent true. The only way to have a physical body is to live in paradox or what seems like paradox. To become enlightened is seeing through the paradox and seeing that there is no real paradox in the end. But that's because you, it, the really to see past the paradox, you got to realize that the, it, you, gotta, you can't be attached to one end of the polarity or the other. So when you make a uh, what you call an affirmation, uh, what I call a supporting statement, same basic idea is we're releasing on the attachment or the aversion to the affirmation, the poor supporting statement, so you can say it and enjoy it or let it go and enjoy it. It's the attachment to it that creates the problem. So if you're trying to affirm something and stuff it down into your head and make it reality, you're doing it wrong. Uh, and wrong is, is also a, a relative thing. Your, uh, yeah. the goal, your goal is to feel good about it and let it go. And yeah, you, could, you, could, you can release on negative statements. You can release on positive statements. You could, you could write a, a supporting statement that contrasts a negative thought in your head and then release on both of them until neither of them matter. And then what happens is like a, a, you can just focus on exactly where you want to go, but neither direction is wrong. You can go left, you can go right. I choose right because that's more in alignment with where I want to be. And that's, so that's the direction I wrote my supporting statement. But either way, I'm not attached to it. So what, whatever ends up happening is beautiful too. You're going free. You're not trying to stuff, you're not trying to make your subconscious experience something. As you go free, then what you choose to experience comes to you naturally and easily. And if you choose something else, that comes to you too. Um, so that's, we write them so that we can release on them and the, the feelings, the emotions, the thoughts and everything that comes up. And, and, and regarding right and wrong, um, <clears throat> a right can very easily switch to a wrong and a wrong can very easily switch to a right. So it depends where you are on the path and what type of paradox you're dealing with. And that's, that is also a very confusing thing for people. Um, I'm st I start out on a path where I'm like, this is the right path. And I'm like, boom, change direction. I'm like, oh, that was the wrong path. Now I'm on the right path. Then I change direction again. Oh, no, that was, there's two wrong paths. Am I going in the right direction? It sure feels right. And then I continue down that road. And eventually, all of those wrongs lead me to the actual right. And, and then that's where I move forward from there. So this is extremely confusing um, in the world of dating, uh, especially for, uh, for men, because women are extremely paradoxical. And, uh, and that's fine. And that's why we love them. Yeah, it is. It gives us something to, uh, men love to work on things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I understand women. No, um, okay. Uh, this is the, I think this is going to be the last question. Let me see. Here. Okay. We literally have two questions, guys. We'll end up, we'll end on these two questions. Um, so don't add any more. Don't, don't tempt me. Um, the, this one, can you experience everything in life, going everywhere and visiting all countries and places? Just want to hear what Dave has to say to that one. <laughs> can you? Sure. There's people that have, that have been to all, I forget how many countries there are. What is it? 196, I think, or was it 213? I can't remember. Um, there are people that have been to every single country. And there's some countries I'm like, how? do you get into those countries? Um, and, and this, the one girl I'm thinking of is an American girl. She's been to, to every country on the planet. So um, I think that's a possibility. Can you experience all? I guess you can, but that's going to be a pretty, uh, a pretty enlightened experience or perspective, I think. I don't know that you would be um, physically able to experience all um, by doing as we know our limits now as people, but as we, I think from a meditative perspective, I'm sure we can experience all. Um, okay, so uh, really good. I love the answer. Um, did you, and that number you gave for all the countries, were you, were you counting micro nations? I'm curious. I, I don't, whatever, whatever the State Department Whatever recognizes as a country Something like that <laughs> you know the oil rig off of england that's the, the uh, uh sealand the principality of sealand yeah places like that i'm wondering if they count yeah, yeah. yeah. i don't i don't think the state department recognizes uh principality of sealand as uh yeah, charles said 195 so i wasn't too far off i think i said like 196 or something like that now but, charles is the is are the micronations in there like the principality of sealand there's a few of them out there so i, I don't i don't think 
I don't think they are, but uh, so yeah. It belongs to the UK, in a sense. So there's a few more of them. There's a bunch of them, actually, where they've created micronations, and, and, uh, and there's a battle over being recognized. So Yeah. Um, interesting. Uh, okay. So um, <laughs> how important is patience during these growth processes? Uh, what have you learned to enjoy during the, the gestation period? How, uh, yeah, what have you learned to enjoy during the gestation period? Patience is critical. Um, I think it's the main tool that allows us to become who we need to become to reach that next level. And patience is put there to force us to go have the experiences that we need to have to grow to the place that we need to get in order to unlock that experience. I said, I agree. You, patience is essential. Okay. So, uh, okay. I got to jump into this. Have you ever been tempted to read another question than the next one? Dave, what are Anna's flaws? Because she seems perfect. So there's the last question. <laughs> wow. That is a setup question. Who wrote that? I'm going to come after him. Aaron. <laughs> what are Anna's flaws? I'm sure Anna's like totally listening right now. Oh, I know she is. Um, well, I'll put it to you this way. She is probably one of the most flawless women I've met. And the reason I say that is because of my history of dating women is extremely extensive. And I've let myself explore a lot to be able to create an ideal model of who I wanted to kind of end up with. And I did a lot of um, meditative work to be able to draw her into my reality and get her um, to become a part of my reality based on all of the dating experience that I do have. And so one of the things was to take all this information of women that were flawless and try to have the most flawless and perfect woman that I could possibly create with my experience. And then I went and did uh, our energetic modeling work and lo and behold, Anna popped up. Now, for the actual flaws, <laughs> these aren't flaws, this is just who she is. And I don't think any of us have flaws. We, we just have our own ways of being. And sometimes they annoy the shit out of people and sometimes they don't. Anna loves to talk. I'm a pretty quiet guy. I don't like to talk a lot. I don't like to have tons of discussion all the time. Um, but for her, it makes her feel very comfortable to discuss and talk a lot. And I mean a lot, she talks a lot. <laughs> but at the same time, she's an excellent communicator. Um, I would say, you know, she's, she's better than me at, at verbal communication. She's phenomenal. Um, but I don't see the talking as a flaw. I just realize that that's a comfort for her. And um, outside of that, you know, she, again, these aren't flaws. Um, we, we all struggle with all of this stuff. Um, she's extremely confident, but at the same time, when she's moving into new realms, she's not 100% confident and none of us really are. So she comes to me a lot with for help, for guidance, because I had been, I've been down these roads before. And so she seeks my help. And again, that's not really a flaw. It's just someone looking for help. And, and I go to my mentors and, and people to help me when I don't know what's going on. And again, that's not a flaw, but we kind of perceive them as flaws, even though they're not. So, you know, and we, we all have our neuroses and in, in, in our crazy moments. I have mine, believe me, and so does she. And this is just life. So um, to answer that question as eloquently as possible, um, that, that those are my words on it. And, and I really don't feel that she's flawed because I, I've been with a lot of flawed women, in my opinion. Um, that, and I say that in a way that is not a negative to them. It's just not what I was looking for and not 
they, they couldn't add up at every level that I needed them to add up to where she does. She does a phenomenal job of ticking all the boxes of everything that I've ever wanted. And um, yeah, so that, that's my uh, talk on flaws, if you will. <laughs> Good, good answer. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that made Anna, well, who knows? We'll, 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 I'm sure you'll have a discussion about it later. <laughs> oh, I'm sure as soon as we, we hang up, my phone is going to be ringing off the hook. <laughs> awesome. Anything you want to say there, Anna? <laughs> okay. Um, no, there she's going to talk. Go for it, Anna. I was just about to say that uh, we're good here. Everything is wonderful and uh, very, uh, very sweet of you, darling. Nah, well, apparently some guys out there think you're flawless and perfect. So just know that today. Well, we all have our flaws. Nobody's uh, perfect. There you go. Um, okay, guys, I want to thank you uh, for attending the webinar. It was awesome having Dave on here. Uh, Dave has tons more stories in there. In one of these days, I'll just, we'll do an interview when we get the podcast studio set up where I'll just dig stories out of Dave all his uh, crazier stories, the ones he forgets about that I kind of remember here and there. Yeah, and there, there's so many, you know, as you, you know, Brian, you know some of them, but you don't know all of them. And um, yeah, there's always more I'm hearing about. There's just so many. And when I see my old friends, they bring up stories. I'm like, what are you talking about? I, mm -hmm. And I, I just don't know because I, I've forgotten about them. And um, it's, uh, it's cool to, to reminisce and bring them back up and talk about them and go through the, the emotions and the feelings of what I, what I was going through at, the, at that age and that time. And, and how I work through it all. So yeah, that would be uh, that would be a fun uh, fun experience for sure. Yeah, we got some good ones. You got the one where you got caught upside down in your wingsuit and you were almost killed yourself. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you got yeah. things like that, and so we can save these stories for the next call. Uh, next time, we'll I'll do some interviews with Dave and pull some good information out of him for you guys. Okay. Um, with that said, I want to thank Dave again. It was awesome having having him here in the call. He's clear out in Maryland right now. Um, yep. on the family, on the family farm ha homestead. And that I am. Yeah, it's an amazing, amazing place. Actually, probably a great place to be if you got to be stuck in a quarantine. Um, lots of space. Yeah, I, I don't really feel quarantined here. I took the dirt bike out the other day and was ripping around on it. So uh, it was uh, yeah. <laughs> guns, dirt bikes, bonfires. Uh, yep. you, you a little bit of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, anything you want to say in closing? Um, guys, uh, just spend a little bit more time trying to uh, make something of yourself and a little less time trying to uh, impress other people. So uh, just get there, get out there and do the work on yourself and then um, people will notice. Awesome. Um, and thank you again. And uh, guys, hopefully you like the new microphone. I, I had to, The problem with the microphone was the cable. I bought a new cable yesterday, so hopefully it was sounding good. I just put it on another setting, so testing out different things. But we will be bringing you better and better equipment and because we're going to be doing a lot of this. I think this is going to become, even after this is over, our new normal, doing a lot of webinars and podcasting and just getting information to you guys. So many of you guys keep telling us how much benefit you're getting out of this, and I can see the changes, and we're all about helping you guys change. So with that said, make sure to comment in the video. It's going to be posted in Facebook later today because it didn't post live at the right time. There was a problem, technical problem. So make sure to comment, make sure to like, make sure to share with anybody you think could use this information. And uh, because it only brings more value to the world and, uh, and especially in this time of need. Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to comment on YouTube because uh, the comments help the algorithm and to share on YouTube, to sh you know, help more people, like we said. Uh, like and subscribe. Hit that notifications bell. If you, if you haven't subscribed to the channel and we're bringing you value, subscribe and hit that notifications bell. Again, it helps the algorithm. And it makes sure that if we keep building this channel, it keeps growing, we can bring you more and more content. That's why you want to share if you want more from us. So get that out there. Uh, we do look at all the comments. So those are important. Make sure to put comments so that we can see what you want more of and, um, and so forth. And um, with that said, um, that's pretty much it, guys. Uh, have a beautiful day. Remember, only the confident re really live. Or I'll say that again. Only the confident really live. I got to say it's, uh, you know, can't say it like a question or whatever I did. Only the company really. I'm going to have to just to sit here and practice. Um, but that's pretty much it, guys. We're out. Take care. Have a beautiful day. Guys, take care.